Hey guys, it's Roscoe, and on the Space Couch set, I thought we'd compare our two Imperial uh, fighters here. We have the standard TIE fighter, then obviously we have the TIE striker. So that's what they look like from the front. Obviously very similar with the cockpit uh, windows. Let's have a look at the side. Obviously very, very different. This is the uh, very familiar hexagonal shape. So this is like a half odd hexagonal, the shape of this, but obviously they stretch much further forward, very much uh, like the TIE Interceptor of course, and the TIE Striker that comes much much later. And you can't see the fuselage on this one at that point, but it's just a standard ball cockpit, whereas this one obviously you can see it's a much longer fuselage. That's because this is a two man craft rather than a single man craft. And then from the back you see there quite similar and just from the top there you go so let's have a look at the spread from the Rogue One uh, ultimate visual guide for the TIE fighter and the TIE striker here is the TIE fighter very nice on there they're grey here in the later films where of course that kind of blue colour that we see that the models have and we see a TIE fighter pilot here as well then the TIE Striker, very graceful it is there. And you can really see the extra length of the cockpit. And you see the side and top view there also. And then there's also a cutaway. Very nice. You can see the Bombardier in the back there. So let's just see what it says about the TIE Striker. More speeder than fighter. The repulsor cores in the tri TIE Striker's body frame not only reduce the overall gravitational weight of the craft, but also act as invisible aerolons, sculpting the air that flows around the fighter. Built to a design based on antiquated exodrive craft and Geonosian starfighters, the fighter features localised repulsor fields that help improve its aerodynamic qualities. Though the striker's cockpit is pressurised for high atmospheric flight, its repulsors grow less effective the further from a gravity well it soars. Nearly every design feature incorporated to make it an agile atmospheric flyer becomes a liability in space, which is nonsense because it wouldn't matter what shape it was in space. <laughs> yeah, so it says corrugated solar panel gather array maximizes limited surface area. The articulated joint for variable geometry configurations such as that, though I can't imagine that's very stable, and that, and then the other one, that. So we'll pop it up like that for now. Very much looks like a bird coming in like this, doesn't it? And it's a rigid quadranium steel foil brace that this is. Wing mounted laser cannons you can't really make them out there yes and the solar power collection that's all the stuff that's internal you see the entry hatch radiator field repulsor rings are on here Ooh. there's also a magnetomic locking mechanism that'll be to keep the wings in the um, chosen configuration Go. Uh, what else? Yeah, not much else. That's all kind of technical stuff like um, laser cannons at the front are SFS HS1 heavy laser cannons and an SFS L S9.3 laser cannon. <laughs> now, it also says universe unusual versatility. The Imperial Starfleet generally frowns on versatility, believing instead that the Empire succeeds through its large number of specialised ships. The TIE Striker is a bold departure from that philosophy and is therefore unpopular among the higher ranks. Admir Admiralty sees a distasteful indecision and wasteful expenditure in multiple design features such as the Striker's atmospheric streamline, ground support cannons, tactical bombing suite and pressurised life support. Pilots, conversely, are immediately enamoured by such novelty. And it is, of course, manufactured by CNR Fleet Systems. 
Uh, it can go 1,500 kilometres an hour, that'll be in the atmosphere. Four fire leak laser cannons, two heavy laser cannons, and a proton bomb chute. Wings of Empire. Standard TIE fighters are at a disadvantage in atmospheric manoeuvres, a fact that enemy pilots have long exploited, and that is why in The Force Awakens, the updated TIE fighters, both the normal one and special forces, do actually have shields now, and that helps them manoeuvre in the atmosphere. The TIE LNs, what lightweight construction and large hexagonal panels are vulnerable to crosswinds and are difficult to steer outside of a vacuum. The TIE striker solves this problem with a more solid stabilising mass in its central hull bracketed, bracketed by its tilting servo mounted wings. Now there again is the TIE fighter silhouette. Uh, spread rather. Let's see what it says. With its re recognisable silhouette, the TIE fighter has become the de facto symbol of Imperial Space Authority. Superiority, sorry. TIE fighters are inexpensive to produce, and so the Empire churns them out in factories scattered across the galaxy, like Luthor, for instance. More than capable of enforcing Imperial law against unarmed or lightly defended civilian transports, the TIE fighter has recently begun facing a more formidable enemy in the Starfighters of the Rebel Alliance. Now here it says, top hatch forms primary access point when not rack mounted. Fighter of the line. The TIE fighter's design limit lineage can trace routes to the Jedi Interceptor flown in the late Clone Wars era, as well as the V-Wing fighters that continued to fly during the early years of the Galactic Empire. The current model is designated the TIE slash LN or Line edition. So short range fighters. As capital ships are preferred for a tactical discussion among the Imperial Starfleet, its starfighter units are not afforded the independence enjoyed by the equivalent rebel pilots. All but the most specialised TIE fighters lack hyperdrives, obviously Darth Vader's X-1 is an exception I believe, making them dependent on launch bases or carrier craft for deployment. The lack of a hyperdrive and resultant navigational systems alongside extended life support and fuel combine to cut down on the TIE's mass. The cockpit, though TIE fighters have minimal perfect uh, perfunctory oxygen scrubbers and pressurised atmospheric seals, TIE pilots routinely wear full flight gear as a precaution. The unshielded ship is vulnerable to micrometeor impacts and combat damage hull breaches. They really are death traps. Now, there's that picture of Jin versus the TIE Fighter that never made it into the film, unfortunately, which is a shame because that is an iconic moment, that kind of face-off. Showdown. At the strata structure on top of the Scarif Citadel, Jin Erso stares down a TIE LN Starfighter. The TIE has vertical takeoff and landing ability thanks to repulsor cyclers in its wing struts, reducing its already small mass to negligible weight and micro-positioning micro thrusts from the twin ion engines. Uh, let's see. It can go 1,200 kilometres an hour in the atmosphere. Now, there's the uh, pilot. He's got a reinforced helmet. I guess that will be sealed with gas transfer hoses. The emergency atmospheric unit, that's the box on his chest. Then it's Comic Transponder in Shockproof Belt Case, which is here, that one there. And Positive Gravity Pressure Boots, so um, like magnets, I guess, he would stick to the surface rather than float off. Graduates from prestigious flight academies across the galaxy undergo rigorous training and testing to become TIE pilots. Do they really? They're so disposable. You think they just like, pick anyone up off the street and throw them in the cockpit and tell them to go on? <laughs> the final phase of testing often occurs on board a larger battleship, such as a Star Destroyer, in order to expose cadets to realistic and relevant surroundings. I guess we kind of saw some of that in Rebels in the um, Skyhook Academy episode where Wedge uh, defects um, with Hobby and Sabine. In the growing fight against the Rebellion, this means TIE cadets may undergo literal trials by fire, plunged into combat situations where to excel is to survive. Yes. So that is just our look at the two TIE fighters here. The, uh, I keep wanting to call it the U-Wing. <laughs> the TIE Striker and the TIE Fighter. I thought this was a great addition 
to uh, the ranks of uh, TIE Fighters. So we didn't see enough of it in the film, I think. Uh, even in the Battle of Scarf to the end, it, it wasn't like it was the major component. There was an entire fleet of them. There was a handful. Ah, uh, well, maybe we'll see them in the Han Solo movie, who knows, or in other canonical material, no doubt. It's already appeared in the Poe Dameron comic in that base that Terex and the criminals uh, open up in at the end of the uh, Empire. Uh, there's one of these in there next to the Carrion Strike. But yes, that is just a look at the two Imperial TIE Fighters. Please subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed this content. Leave me a comment or suggestion for what kind of topic you'd like to see discussed or like the video.